Hello, everyone, and welcome to Porch Talk Presents Sports Talk. I am Adam Van, and I am joined, as always, with my co-host when it comes to all discussion of sports, and that's Marcus. What's going on, Marcus? Happy to make the hot tag and join you on the porch to talk some sports, man. And uh, I see a little bit of the grief shelf, the grief shelf behind you. I'm not mad at it. <laughs> <laughs> I always, you know what, again, on the porch, we do video podcasts. I know that's frowned upon some other places in the soon-to-be-named network, but I make sure that anybody who has the unfortunate... Uh, displeasure of looking at my face gets to see a cardboard cutout of Alexa behind me. So uh, enjoy, enjoy. <laughs> Prime too, respectfully. <laughs> and the best thing is, like nobody gets to see what's what's on the wall on the other side of the camera. Like that, that's just for me to look at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid to ask. Uh, but, After but, the show. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm happy to to talk sports with you here because uh, over at Final Wrestling Place. Me and Tim might talk a little bit of sports, but he reels me in, so I can't really like really go into like any further details, expound about expound upon anything. Um, and we know that Papa Joe frowns upon it as well. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we got to do. Uh, if I want to talk sports, I have to make a whole different uh, podcast with uh, with Todd. So. Yeah, <laughs> the, the the great uh, helmet podcast, uh, No That's Chance right. in Helmet, limited run engagement. Go check that out. But yeah, one of my highlights, uh, one of the many highlights of listening to Final Wrestling Place is uh, the occasional baseball rant or celebratory conversation that comes in there, and also listening to Tim jump on and off of bandwagons as the seasons (laughs) go by. (laughs) Yeah, he's definitely, uh, he'll like check in maybe once or twice a month, check out. (laughs) <laughs> Come back, check in. Say, hey, how are my teams doing? All right. Just checking and the temperature. Just checking the temperature. That'll determine the next time he checks in. <laughs> yeah, but absolutely. So you and I had kind of loose plans to do uh, this episode for a while now. Uh, the yeah. original plan was to do it before the playoffs started. But, uh, you know, things come up. You're a busy dad. Uh, I am busy doing doll safaris and sleeping <laughs> till one o'clock in the afternoon. So, uh Happy to get it. it in now. Yeah, it's mostly just me being forgetful. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's, it's all good. It's all good. But you know what? It's it's a good thing that we did it today mm-hmm. because today was a good day, Marcus. <laughs> today was the, the best day we've had uh, in quite some time. Oh, tell them about it. Tell them about it. Uh, so as of recording, this is uh, October 17th. Uh, in the year 2022, 18. And, oh, it's the 1830. Oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh! There we go. I'm forgetful. It's October 18th, um, and the Yankees have just uh, completed a five-game series with the um, very scrappy Cleveland Guardians, uh, taking Absolutely. the series three to two, uh, winning two games in a row, uh, which I thought was not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, New York. We're gonna be on to Houston in my mind. I enjoyed the win for about three minutes, and it's on yeah. to Houston. Uh, I know some of our uh, mutuals online are not over it, <laughs> being <laughs> Cleveland fans. But hey, uh, it's it's a, it's kind of a little brother, big brother situation. You want to punch up to to big brother, and sometimes big brother's got to put you down, remind you where you're at. And uh, <laughs> like I said, we're on to Houston. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you, like going into this series against the Guardians, I fully expected I I, I don't want to come off as arrogant because and we'll get into this later on in the show. Uh, I do not have strong feelings of like a deep Yankees run, but I always assumed that they would handle the Guardians. Mm. Like I did not expect that to go to five games. I fully expected my mind that we'd win the two in New York and win one of them in Cleveland. And I had a very vigorous and long planned out trolling campaign of things I was going to tweet if the Yankees won in Cleveland about it being (laughs) Aaron Judge's land now. And, uh, And honestly, it got to the point where I was convinced that there was no chance the the Yankees were going to pull this off. Like three run lead, four run lead. Like, nope, not good enough. We need 20 runs or somehow they're going to dink and dunk their way back to taking this thing. And I at no point felt confident in that series after, after game two. No, um, especially on Twitter when uh, the lineup from the Yankees got put out and like the pitching 
rotation got put out for the rest of the playoffs. And Boone is out there giving quotes about uh, this is our plans for game two, three, four, and like we'll figure out five. And like you, I figured we would wrap this up in four. But as soon as I saw Boone almost premeditating to botch two games of the series, I'm like, why would we do such a thing? <laughs> why not just end it when we can? And we messed around. And it felt like we intentionally lost game two. We intentionally lost game three. Uh, and then we had to, to turn the jets on and really scrap uh, and get the bats going to win game, win game four and five. Uh, so, yeah, I was definitely panicked. I was definitely panicked. Thankfully, we got a uh, an ace outing from Severino in game three, which is like, okay, we're going to get this. Uh, and then that's when really the bullpen mismanagement really kicked in. Yeah. It's unfortunate, and like you mentioned, Severino having uh, an ace outing. I mean, you got to give credit. This is probably the best postseason that Cole has had as a Yankee. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Nestor Cortez, a guy that a year ago, if you said, oh, your playoff lives are going to be dependent on Nestor Cortez, like you wouldn't have gone into that feeling confident. But like when there was the rain out yesterday and they said that because of the extra day that Cortez was going to start, like it was a weight was lifted off my shoulders, you know, having him go. Yeah, I was concerned because I think there's a stat in the last couple years, starters on three days rest in the playoffs are like seven and 15. Mm -hmm. um, and the ERA is like six or something ridiculously high. Um so I didn't, I was like, oof, once I heard that, I wasn't too sure about it, but um, I don't know the splits, but I felt like Cleveland struggled a bit with left-handed pitching with so many righties uh, in their lineup. And um, so that was kind of our saving grace. And yeah, like you said, to think that Nestor was going to be our second ace, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, even going into the playoffs, I didn't believe it. I was like, he's a, he's a game three guy. And like, I know we like Seve, but I figured we'd piggyback Seve with another starter. Um, well, there was a lot of people saying that Cortez should have pitched game one, you know, that, right. that was a huge argument because, you know, Cole had a good season. He led the league in strikeouts, but he gave up a billion home runs right. and he was not the shutdown ace that, you know, he was in Houston. So there was a, a very strong case to having Cortez be the number one, but you kind of got to start the guy that you're paying a hundred million dollars <laughs> an inning to, you know? <laughs> yeah, there was, there was almost like no internal Yankees debate about it as far as like uh, the front office went, like Cole was getting the ball game one. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there was a discussion because like Nestor pitched great this season. He really carried the team. Cole had his ups and downs. Nestor, he had a couple bad starts here and there. I would say no more than three or four, whereas Cole, like, his whole September was not very good. Uh, he really struggled down the stretch. So I was nervous a little bit. Uh, but Cole gave us two dominant ace outings. Um, even though ace outings are a little bit different now than what they used to be. Uh, yeah. I think I think if you can go a uh, quality start and only give up, you know, two runs – um, I think that's a, an ace outing in these, these, the current climate of playoff baseball. So, yeah, I think Cole, uh, some people online, I'll ask you this. Do you think Cole earned his pinstripes? I, I, winning uh, a divisional series game, series, whatever, I don't think that that does enough. Like, that can earn you whatever the, the pinstripe, pinstripe equivalent is on a lot of other franchises, mm -hmm. but... Obviously, it's cliche to say 27 championships. We're not playing for a trip to the ALCS. Right. You know, so thank you for what you did in that round, Cole. But, like, you ain't earned your pinstripes. And the same thing with, like, you know, people are giving the flowers to Harrison Bader and Giancarlo Stanton. And, like, I'm, I'm not willing to put these people in the pantheon of Yankees unless they get it done. And they haven't gotten it done yet. You know, we'll get into our predictions later on. But... Um, one other thing that, you know, to kind of wrap this up uh, as far as the series with the Guardians, one of the places other than the dink and dunk and bloop uh, <laughs> offense of the Guardians, but one of the places where they were really good was their bullpen. Yeah. And that was an area that, you know, 
maybe leading up to the all-star game or three quarters of the way into the season, we're like, man, we got the bullpen locked down. Right. And then everybody died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there was huge discussions back in like looking into the postseason back when we were, you know, a <laughs> hundred and, and, and two, it felt like, um, who's going to make this playoff roster because, you know, you can't carry more than 13 pitchers. Uh, the bullpen was so stacked. Like there was going to be at least two people left off the roster just from the bullpen alone who deserve to be there. And King went down and Chad Green went down and Johnny thankfully now has turned it on, but Wiseka looked bad and Chapman was shut down and looked bad. And Clay Holmes reached his uh, career high for innings pitch before the all-star break. Yeah. <laughs> and, like anybody who's seen baseball before could tell you like, maybe you should cool off on that guy. Um, so yeah, yeah, I was definitely concerned about the bullpen coming into this. Cleveland had that advantage. Um, and yeah, hats off to Cleveland. Like, They've got the low payroll, uh, you know, small town market, all that good stuff. But like, I mean, they took the Bronx Bombers and uh, the the multi million dollar <laughs> evil empire to the limit, um, and and they really made us, <laughs> really made the guys getting paid a lot earn those paychecks, like Stanton and Judge, or presumably Judge uh, with with his next <laughs> contract. But yeah, um, yeah, I was definitely concerned about the bullpen, but um, yeah, I guess later on when we preview the Houston series. I hope we didn't uh, work ourselves into a shoot. Like, I hope we didn't unload everything we had to get to the ALCS. Yeah, but at the same time, you can't leave any bullets in the chamber right. and then not make it. So right. uh, it's like that wild card game a couple of years ago where the the Orioles or Buck Showalter didn't play uh, Zach Britton. You know, speaking yeah. of relievers, <laughs> you know, in a, in a tie game, he, he didn't want to waste Britton because he wanted to save him for the series that they weren't guaranteed to be in yet, you know? Yeah, that's happened a couple times the last few years. Like you said, Britton uh, with Baltimore. I remember Washington did it with Strasburg. The Mets did it with Syndergaard and DeGrom. So, yeah, there's a long history of that. So you got to you got to get it done to to make it. Absolutely. But uh, again, congratulations to the Guardians. Congratulations to the Guardians fans. Heck except of a for season. one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but as Marcus alluded to, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go over some predictions of end of season, regular season awards, kind of like what Marcus and I think are, and you know, we'll get into this in a second, like the Cy Young Award winners, the Rookie of the Year, and so on and so forth, and kind of present our cases for who we think the winners of these awards, and these are regular season awards, obviously, uh, there might be some bias leaking in uh, as far as who did what in the postseason, but we'll do our best to stomp that out. But uh, Marcus, let's start with pitching since we were just talking about the bullpen. All right. I'm going to throw it over to you. Who do you think should be the National League Cy Young Award winner? Uh, if I had a vote, my National League Cy Young Award winner would be Sandy Alcantara from the Miami Marlins. Now the Marlins didn't much, didn't make much noise uh, during the season. Um, I think the most noise they made was before the season started when Derek Jeter left. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the highlight and low point of their season. Uh, but this guy pitched outstanding. I want to uh, pull up his stats real quick from uh, this season. Uh, now he kind of had some Cy Young buzz going into the season, but it was a lot of like, put him in like a top five category, right? Or like top 10 vote getter. Um, but let's see. I actually have some stats here. Oh, okay. Pull them up. Yeah. I agree with you. So, uh, Sandy Alcantara was my uh, National League Cy Young uh, presumptive winner as well. Sandy Alcantara, a guy who I had in fantasy baseball last year before he quite figured it out. And then I didn't draft him this year because uh. I was like, ah, oh, he didn't do well for me last year. Uh, so I'm going to pass on him. But Sandy had a 2.28 ERA. <sighs> yeah. Uh, led baseball in innings with 228 and two thirds innings with six complete games and 14 wins on a very bad team. Yeah, that's just <laughs> you're not, you're not getting that um, even from the guys that you're paying uh, you know buku bucks to. You're just not getting that. Um, and the Marlins are one of those teams that they're stocked with starting pitching, and you yeah. really would have wished they would have 
taking one or two of those arms either from <laughs> the farm system or the major leagues and go get some bats, which is what Jeter wanted. Um, but in all that turmoil for this dude to show up and pitch, like people kind of predicted him to, but at the same time, like exceed those expectations as well. I was blown away. Um, being in a Philadelphia market, I get to see a lot of Phillies games, uh, whether I want to or not. Uh, so I got to see Sandy pitch quite a bit. Uh, and then also it seemed like any time they had a West Coast game, it was always like the MLB Network game. Uh, so if I was up late, I was watching like him versus the Dodgers. The Dodgers kind of owned him, which was weird. But uh, any other West Coast games that he pitched on, like he was just tremendous. So uh, that's my song, Cy Young Vote Award winner. All right. Yeah, like we actually, like I said, we overlapped on that and we're going to alternate just so I don't seem like I'm currying favor with you and uh, just copying your answer. So I'm going to go over to the American League for the Cy Young. I was kind of torn on this. Uh, I could have very easily, I could have done a bit and just picked a Yankee for every one of them <laughs> <laughs> because Garrett Cole did lead uh, the match, uh, the Major League Baseball in strikeouts with 257. So I could have said Cole, I said could have said Cortez. Um, there is the obvious front runner, but I'm going to actually go with Dylan Cease from the Chicago White Sox. Okay. Um, did not quite have the, the national exposure of maybe a Verlander, but he had a streak in the middle of the season where he had 14 starts in a row with one run or fewer. Yeah, that's uh, incredible. This is another guy who just played on an underwhelming team. You know, he didn't get a lot of wins because the White Sox were booty and, uh, you know, just kind of didn't put it together under La Russa. But uh, Cease was a guy, again, I hate to bring it back to fantasy, but I rode him for a lot of wins that I did not deserve. Uh, so Dylan Cease is my pick. Yeah, he kind of came out of nowhere because he was kind of like the third or fourth arm for Chicago and yeah. didn't have the same hype as like a Kopech or – um giolito did and um yeah he really came out of nowhere this season just pitched lights out uh one of the few high points for a very disappointing white Sox team uh kind of a chic pick to win the world series or at least go to the world series this year uh, and to come out of the al mid but that didn't happen mm-hmm. um i think this is where i let my own narrative affect my judgment uh, as good as Cease was, you mentioned his name. My vote getter would be Justin Verlander. Um, not just because he's coming off of Tommy John, but uh, pulling up his stats. Uh, so he did go 175 innings pitched. He did have a 15 day DL uh, IL stint in September, which was kind of one of those like phantom IL stints just to cool him off for the yeah, uh, playoffs. Rest. And he didn't have a great playoff start either uh, against the Mariners, I believe. Yeah, he got rocked against the Mariners. Um, But, like, just talking regular season, he pitched 175 innings for a guy who's pushing 40 years old. And uh, on a team where they didn't need him to do that, the Astros really could have slept walk uh, to win their division. We got a couple people were like, oh, what about the Mariners? What about the Angels? And we'll talk about them later. <laughs> um, but it, it was Houston's division the whole time. And they really didn't need that kind of performance from them. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I was just super impressed by Verlander, um, especially with, you know, his home starts, like pitching with the Crawford boxes out there. <laughs> like if you hit a, a pop, fly to, pop fly to left field, it's uh, it's gone at like 300 feet. But, but Marcus, that's a major league baseball stadium. It's not a little league field like in New York. Oh, my goodness. Right. Yeah. yeah not New York where it's 408 uh, to hit a ball out of center field. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I had Verlander on my short list, as I mentioned before. Uh, an interesting stat that I found out, like, obviously, great season on a great team. 1.75 ERA was actually the lowest ERA from a starting pitcher that was qualified since 2000. Uh so, like, that's 22 years of baseball. And as wow. you mentioned, a guy that uh, who knew, like, was he ever going to be able to come back and be a starting pitcher or right. reliever? Uh, or is he just going to go home to Kate Upton and just say the heck with this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> stronger man than I am. That's I sure. know <laughs> just take those, <laughs> those Detroit paychecks and stay home. Uh, but, yeah, uh, a great pitcher. And maybe his name will come up later in another category. Maybe it won't. But, uh, yeah, so interesting there. We crossed over on one, and we didn't cross over on the other. So I'm going to move it over to Rookie of the Year. Marcus, National League Rookie of the Year, if you would. Uh, Let me pull up my vote-getter stats. Um, My National League Rookie of the Year 
would be Michael Harris, the second center fielder for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Tim's Atlanta Braves <laughs> when he wants to check in. Um, I try to see when he got called up. Uh, I think he was a May call up, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, it was- but- Middle, kind of like middle of the season, if I'm not, yeah, I, it's, I'm fuzzy on that. Okay, but yeah, he definitely started the year in AAA, uh, came out with the big leagues, he had 414 at-bats, 123 hits, 75 runs scored, and he mostly batted towards the bottom of their lineup, so like, for him to get 75 runs, that's pretty good. Um, 21 uh, based on balls, 64 RBI, hit 297 in a year where the league average was like... 220 or down down towards there um so he was really an above average hitter this whole season yeah what and, i'm seeing if i may uh i'm seeing here when atlanta called him up they were 22 and 24 so they were 46 games into the season with a below 500 record and after the call up they were major league best 79 and 37 yeah so, he was kind of the spark to get that offense going um because they had so many dudes who you know, talking about like how high players are paid or whatever, but like there's a lot of big earners on those Braves teams that have earned those contracts by coming up to the farm system and, and delivering on their expectations uh, like Acuna and, and like Albies and, and guys like those um, and recently traded Matt Olson. Uh, so yeah, for him to come up and for the Braves to like recognize that, Hey, we can't just bank on being world series champions. Like that was last season. We got to do something to get this team going for him to be the call up and to be that move uh, as opposed to going to the trade market and for him to come up and perform like that. Uh, he's definitely my NL rookie of the year. Yeah. And they have him locked down long-term, I believe. Yeah. He signed a big boy contract too. Yeah. Um, I had Michael Harris on as like a 50, 50. I was going to wait and see if we had any overlap on this. And if you can convince me to your case, my other person I'm going to I'm going to leave this my my decision for a second but my other person was actually also from Tim's Atlanta Braves mm-hmm. and that is rookie pitcher Spencer Strider. Yeah. Um I mentioned strikeouts a bunch. I mentioned Cole strikeouts and ceases. This dude had a uh, 13.8, <laughs> almost 14 Ks per 9. That's insane. 202 Ks from a rookie pitcher. Um the reason why I think I might lean towards Strider is because you never see a rookie pitcher deliver on the hype. It's always right. their second year, the third year. They come up with a lot of promise, and they're always on like an innings count, right. or they just can't quite figure out major league pit, uh, batters yet, and uh, it takes them a year or two for it to click. Uh, but Strider hit the ground running, and yeah. uh, I think it's much harder – to, to just come out as a rookie pitcher and not have your arm fall off within the first month. So I'm going to go Strider. Especially in that division, too. Like, that's... A, yeah. <laughs> sure, the, the Marlins are kind of a, a freebie, but, like, you got to compete with the Mets. And not just compete. Like, you're on a World Series team. And to hold your own against the Mets and against the Phillies, it's like, whew, that's, yeah. that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Again, the Braves had a, a great regular season. My apologies again to Tim. Uh, if he doesn't listen to this, shame on him. But by all means, extend my condolences for the disappointing <laughs> early exit. But all right. So again, we're kind of off track with that one. So let's go over to the American League. And I'm going to go first on this one. And this I don't think is who people will pick as their rookie of the year. Maybe he's in their top five, but. This also might be a case of recency bias, but I'm going to go with Stephen Kwan from the Cleveland Guardians. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, obviously, having just watched the playoff series against the Yanks, it's not relevant to the award, but still, this is a guy that's impossible to get out. During the mm-hmm. regular season, he batted 298 for a freaking rookie. Uh, I think he struck out three times all season. <laughs> you know, But no, he actually <laughs> had 62 walks to 60 Ks. So he walked more than he struck out and he played pretty much the whole season. I think he was on the roster from spring training. I don't think he started right away, but within the first few weeks of the season, he was their everyday starter, everyday leadoff guy. Uh, Just a guy who constantly makes contact, constantly got on base, was driven in by uh, all the Ramirez and all the other guardians. Uh, Steven Kwan's my pick for the rookie of the year. Yeah, they even let go of uh, Oscar Marquedo, 
uh, or Mercado uh, during the season, who was going to be like their big kind of outfielder. Um, and Quan just outplayed him, and Mercado could never get off the ground this season. And they they let him go, I think, in July or August. Um, also, as a uh, opportunity maker and taker, uh, <laughs> Quan was easy money. Uh, cat, king of the parlay. You you throw him in a hit parlay, and you know he's coming through. If you want to throw big money down on a, a Quan opportunity for one hit or two total bases, he's coming through every single time. So, uh, Mr. Quan, I would like to thank you. <laughs> uh, Marcus, you gotta start. You gotta start like a not a one nine hundred number. That's Joe's gimmick. But let's start like a, a website behind a paywall with some of your betting advice you know oh, it hasn't been <laughs> you don't want it the last couple weeks it hasn't been too good i think it's like uh major league baseball you just gotta be right three times out of ten you'll be a hall of famer like a weatherman yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you who's your american league pick uh i am gonna go with the sexy pick uh and that is julio rodriguez uh center fielder for the seattle mariners uh, Seattle Mariners have a long-standing history of these rookies that come up and perform huge uh, and then take their team to the playoffs. And they haven't had that in quite some time, uh, really since A-Rod. Yeah. Um, Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> yeah, A-Rod, Ken Griffey Jr., right. Um, so for uh, Julio Rodriguez to get the call up to start the season, uh, hitting leadoff, and this, this kid hit 28 home runs in – what is very much a pitcher's ballpark, uh, 75, R, uh, 75 RBI, uh, 25 stolen bases as well, 40 bases on balls. He did strike out a good bit, uh, 145 times, but that batting average uh, up was up at 284. The on pace, on base percentage was 345. Um, OPS plus, uh, yeah, one dot, yeah, so he he did great. Um, I was super impressed by him, and he also got a big boy contract uh, yeah. while the season was still ongoing. So he's going to be in Seattle for quite some time. Um, and he definitely lived up to the hype. He does, you know, I'm not going to say he's uh, in the same air as uh, my favorite player of all time, Ken Griffey Jr. Um, but he's definitely living up to the hype. And uh, I think a rookie of the year award is in order for him. Yeah. It's a guy that obviously based on those stats had a great year. And you mentioned that Seattle's ballpark is cavernous, to put it lightly. One of my favorite feel-good baseball players. Like, I obviously, I gravitate to the, un like, a lot of lesser-tier players, as a lot of people know, Nick Swisher is, like, one of my favorite Yankees. Uh, but, like, I am a huge fan of Jesse Winker, who played mm -hmm. in Great American Small Park for the yep. <laughs> Cincinnati Reds, just b hit bombs after bombs <laughs> after bombs, got traded to Seattle, and I was big mad about that. I was big mad. Yep. Yeah. And he never hit another home run again. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was like Willie Mays Hayes in the major league movies where he was just hitting to warning track over and over again. You know? <laughs> and like half of his fly balls would have been out in Cincinnati, but they weren't in Seattle. So it's a tough place to hit. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things. West coast. You just don't see enough of their games when you live right. on the East coast, you know? Right. And the main thing for him too, to, really like anchor that team uh, that ended their what 20 something year playoff drought. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that kind of gives him the extra boost for me. Oh, and then, yes. and in the playoffs, like he was, he was phenomenal too. Yeah. I saw a great graphic, you know, on social media where it was like one of those things where like the last time the Mariners won a playoff series or a playoff game, it was like, you know, my space wasn't invented yet. And uh, wow. the iPod didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and, like all of those things. So uh, good on the Mariners. Uh, hopefully next year they'll uh, next year will be their year, maybe to at least get out of the first round. Yeah, maybe uh, they'll see the Yankees in the ALCS. Oh, good. We'll stomp them out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to mix it up a little bit and I'm going to go with something that I don't even think this is a real award. This is more of an NFL award, but hell with it. This is our show. I'm going to go with comeback player of the year. Or most improved player, however you want to shape it. But let's start with the National League. Marcus, do you have a National League comeback player of the year? Sure do. It's uh, Ronald Acuna for uh, the Atlanta Braves. Tore his ACL last season. Uh, once he tore his ACL, it was kind of like, oh no. Like, the Braves season is done. Pack it up. 
Uh, he is one of these generational talents um, that seem to be coming by more frequently mm-hmm. in baseball. But uh, yeah, for him to come back from a torn ACL as quick as he did, they started him off in uh, as DH. Now his his numbers haven't really matched his career numbers, but still, like it's going to take you a long time to come back from an ACL injury. Those aren't even like super super common in baseball. You more often get like your elbow injuries. Uh, and back and lat injuries. So um, to come back from a, an ACL uh, to work his way back and then to be a big part of that Atlanta uh, offense. Um, yeah, he's my comeback player of the year. A lot of valid points. The only thing I will not disagree with you on, but say why I wouldn't consider Cunha for my award is, as you mentioned, very young guy, you know, somebody who has a ton of great years ahead of him. Uh, it, odds were that he was going to might not have been this season. Maybe it would have been next season, but he was going to get back to where he was. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go with somebody a little bit on the opposite age spectrum. And I'm going to go with Mr. Albert Pujols, the machine. Oh uh, yeah. This is a guy who much like most players who go out to Anaheim was left for dead. Yep. Uh, just scrapped said, go We We're not even platooning anymore. You're not worth a pinch hit. Uh, obviously he goes back home to St. Louis, to the Cardinals, uh, as a part-time player, hits 24 home runs, 68 RBIs, a 270 batting average, which isn't great for Albert Pujols, but it's great for most of the league, yep. and exceeds the 700 home runs, uh, gets to have a great farewell, doesn't have to go and retire with that question mark or finishing on 699. Uh, if that had happened, I would have wanted him to come back for the first week of next year. But uh, maybe as an old timer myself, I'm a little biased, but I had to go with Pujols. Yeah, uh, Winnie the Pujols, Albert Pujols, <laughs> uh, me and Mr. Tim to this day will still mention um, just seeing Albert Pujols play like the Pirates and just turn on a fastball or a hanger uh, for like 700 feet. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen a ball hit so hard uh, up until I saw Aaron Judge in person. Uh, but yeah, Pujols, I think, is if you want to put a qualifier on it, um, you know one of the best hitters of like the, the first 20 years uh, yeah. of the new century. Um, and then he had his little Dodger stint in there too. And yeah, towards the end of that, he just kind of looked like a DFA candidate. Like, Hey, like he's just washed out. He doesn't have it anymore. Uh, obviously, I mean, obviously he's what, 42 years old or whatever. So to see hey, him go I'm back to <laughs> <laughs> in baseball years, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, for him to, go back to st louis where it wasn't like all roses when he left um especially with like them being like we're not paying you (laughs) for past services um to go there and kind of you know just put a nice little bow on that time and kind of atone for the what eight years or so that were just lost to time and space out in the (laughs) uh, la for both teams uh, it definitely makes me feel good as a baseball fan to see him, especially go out with Wayne Wright and, and Yachty, too. Um, that yeah. was just really special. Can you imagine if not only if he didn't leave St. Louis, because there's something to be said about like playing there. And obviously, you know, it's not like Anaheim is this pitcher's ballpark, but, you know, he just always had better numbers, both as a younger player eight years ago and now as a 42 year old just seems to play better in St. Louis. Like Mm -hmm. if he didn't, you know, leave on that big free agent deal, uh, or maybe you could say didn't get the, the heel injury or the plantar fasciitis. I think he had something with his foot that kind of took away his power for a year or two. This is a guy who not only would have like potentially exceeded like Babe Ruth's home runs, but could have taken bonds out, you know? Yeah. For, like if he goes to if he stays in St. Louis, right, which is I think it's an average ballpark as far as you know, to lending towards pitchers or hitters. Um, but yeah, going out to L.A. and just like the instability of that franchise. He was there for the Josh Hamilton uh, fiasco years, Jeez, yeah. um, where they spent a lot of money on like the C.J. Wilsons, um, you know, bad a lot of bad contracts. Maybe he was one of them, um, and just a franchise that was like hot and cold on spending and building a winner. Like when you pay Albert Pujols, you're not playing for a wild card. Um, like you need to go all in on a world series. And that franchise was just never all in, um, enabled to 
build a farm system his whole entire career there um probably begging for somebody to come take his job (laughs) still (laughs) towards ed like i wouldn't say anybody earned the first base position it was just like we just have to try younger guys yeah so uh my uh comeback go ahead it's it's my turn to recommend and i want to lead this off okay because this has some pomp and circumstance to it and some respect that needs to be put on this name. And this is the entire reason why I wanted to go first on this one, Marcus. And I want to give my American League Comeback Player of the Year to the most feared power hitter in all of baseball, the face of New York baseball, Matt Carpenter. Oh, cart baby. <laughs> this is a guy who hit three... All right, first of all, speaking of left for dead... This is a guy that the Cardinals, the aforementioned Cardinals, were like, nah, you ain't good enough to be a bench player for us. Right. So he basically was like, all right, I'm out from the Cardinals. And he went to where Major League Baseball players go to die, the Texas Rangers. Wasn't good enough to play for the Texas Rangers. So he got DFA'd by the Rangers, signed by the Yankees. And basically in 47 games, hits 37 RBIs, 15 home runs. Three a 305 batting average, and this is my favorite part: a 727 slugging percentage. Sheesh. Judge's slugging slugging percentage was 686. <laughs> so nearly like more than 50 points higher slugging percentage than Judge. And yes, he had the foot injury, and yes, he didn't quite come through on the two pinch hit uh appearances in the playoffs, but again, the playoffs don't matter for this, but uh Nobody strikes fear into major league pitching like 2022 Matt Carpenter. We line up on uh, our award. I do give it to Carp. Um, you know, I was going to give it to Verlander, but Verlander yeah. got my Cy Young love. Um, and, you know, I think this is a perfect award for Carpenter. He had such a good story, like you said, uh, getting played out, getting uh, taken out back by the Cardinals <laughs> and getting put, to put in the dome. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then during the off season, like going to different batters, uh, going to like Joey Votto and going to different guys and like just doing a tour of like, what can I change about my swing? And like Joey Votto is a guy who changed up his swing uh, and he probably did so to the tune of like a Hall of Fame uh, nomination, uh, even though he really hasn't done too much as a player. He's just been solidly consistent and found ways to reinvent himself. Uh, and Carpenter did the same thing, uh, focused on his launch angle. He changed his swing, which was like really cool to watch videos about that. And like just how it like, you know, what, 12, 13 years in the bigs or whatever, like to just completely change your swing and your mechanics and uh, not be too prideful to do that. And just, you know, hey, this is how I solved this, is how I solved my problems 10 years ago. It's the same way I'm going to do it now. Like, no, he, he changed things about himself. Uh, blessing to get released by <laughs> the Rangers, um, you know, who went out and spent a buttload of money in the off season. Uh, and yeah, to end up in New York, which it definitely does help, uh, with a short porch. Can't deny that. Um, Carpenter was a, a short porch King, but, uh, he was putting up numbers that we literally have not seen in baseball during the stretch. He was better than Barry Bonds at his best stretch. Uh, when he broke the single season home run record. So like this was the best hitter that we've ever, <laughs> ever seen in our lifetime. Yeah. And during then, that stretch, that small sample size. And then, you know, he just has a freak accident, uh, a break in a bone in his foot, uh, fielding the ball. Was that July, August? Uh, and he I said his he first fouled it. I thought it was like a foul. If I'm not he, mistaken. He might've fouled it. And then I know he was playing the field and like, that's where it like Aggravated really gave it. out. Yeah. Okay. Um, his first words, I'll be back. <laughs> He's like, I'm not, I'm not done yet. Yeah. Uh, and sure enough, the last, last series against the Texas Rangers, he's healthy, ready to go. Um, I don't know if they really played him, but he was ready to go and, and back on the bench. So, yeah, yeah love that for Carpenter. And um, especially the year that the Yankees have, it's like, who's going to be the other bat? And you think it's going to be Stanton? But, like, he <laughs> had a Stanton year. So Carpenter really provided the – the extra oomph in the lineup uh, other than Aaron judge. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's one of those things. If you're not a Yankee fan, 
you probably don't either know who Matt Carpenter is or know what he was able to produce during that small window where uh, he started getting a lot of pinch hit appearances and starting, uh, you know, starts. But man, uh, I don't know what's going to happen with him next year. Uh, I, I hope he gets an invite to camp. I hope he makes the team, but I don't know. We'll see. But I would like to think he made himself at least like $5 million. Like, just to be a DH uh, and clubhouse presence guy to, to uh, tie this together in like a wrestling uh, um, uh, shoot, like a wrestling um, comparison yeah, uh, for Joe. Yeah. <laughs> so Joe, you know how Christian was just like, Hey, heck of a solid hand, <laughs> solid hand, his whole career. He had one good year. It was like, Whoa, you're really good. You're top five guy for us. And then he just went back to being a solid hand. This this run was like his one more match run. <laughs> Just <laughs> out of the blue, out of nowhere, late stages of his career. Just all time legendary stuff. Ah, <laughs> oh, well, who's the Yankee that he's gonna take under his wing to be his Luchasaurus? That's the that's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the only thing we have left as far as awards is the big ones. But Marcus, do you have any other honorable mentions, anything else you want to kind of shout out from the season? Any uh, awards that you want to hand out? Uh, Yeah, I have one I want to talk about and I'm a big trade deadline, dude. Uh, I hate how in baseball, like baseball has the most active trade deadline out of um, all the sports, I think. Um, And you have your, your biggest chance of seeing a big name get moved during the deadline. Just because teams have different financial reasons, especially with like the uh, not a salary cap, but it's basically the salary cap, um, yeah, luxury the luxury tax. tax. Yeah. Uh, teams trying to get under that. Uh, teams willing to go over it. You know, circumstances pending. Uh, so, I live for the trade deadline, and I wanted to ask you, Adam, did you have a trade of the year? Something that you think a team, a move a team made that you really thought put them in the edge, uh, over the edge, whether it was for this season, whether it's also setting them up for next season, helping them make a playoff push, uh, or something that you really liked but just didn't work out. Yeah, I mean, I can spend 20 minutes complaining about the non-trades that the Yankees made or the trades that they made that uh, ended up resulting in having a dead-armed pitcher. Mm -hmm. But I think I'll go with the easiest answer, and that's Juan Soto to the Padres. Oh, okay. Um, obviously Soto, a guy who walks more, uh, gets on base more than any other player in baseball, like Barry Bonds levels of on base percentage. And with the Padres losing to, uh, losing Tatis to steroids, uh, getting that (laughs) suspension, uh, you know, the the Padres looked like their playoff chances were going to, uh, kind of go down the toilet, but between Machado getting hot at the last minute and, uh, Soto, finally finding his groove and the fact that Soto's really young and they have him for, I believe two more seasons, two more seasons yeah, before you uh, even have to extend them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's obviously an up and coming franchise that's in the final four of the playoffs this year uh, that really stick their claim to potentially at least being a wild card threat in the, their division, their conference for the rest of uh, the next two years, at least. Yeah, I love the Soto move for San Diego or whoever was going to make it. Uh, that's I would have a deal. rather it was New York. <laughs> oh my gosh, right. Um, especially considering what it took to go get him. Like, you can only give up but so much to go get somebody. Yeah. And even looking at what the Padres gave up was like a fringe MLB-ready arm with Mackenzie Gore, their top prospect, and like another top prospect, and then like two lower end prospects like they gave up five or six players to go get the closest thing again that we have to Barry Bonds uh talking about his his walk percentage and on base percentage and he's also like 22 years old and he's already won a world series and he's already been a clubhouse leader for a bad franchise he's already been through the ups and downs he's already experienced it all (laughs) and he's been in the league for like three or four years so I'm like you absolutely go get this dude And you don't even have to worry about extending him. Like you can make the trade and he will pay off the trade within those two years. 
you don't even have to extend him to justify what you gave up because those prospects aren't going to shake out. Um, I think like the closest comparison to that trade was the trade the Tigers made for um, Miguel Cabrera, and they also like threw in Dontrell Willis uh, into that deal. And like the only names they gave up was uh, like Cameron Mabin was the only (laughs) dude who like really turned into anything. And he's, a replacement level MLB player. Like I love Cameron Maven, one of my favorites, but like yeah. just a sentimental favorite. Like he was a underrated, top pros- underrated yeah. yes booth guy too. Oh, he's so good in the booth. <laughs> so good in the booth. That's how he can get into the Hall of Fame. But uh, yeah, just for his career, he's just like, okay, he turned out to be an MLB player. Nothing special. Like that's what prospects are. And like if you give up a prospect and they turn out to be like, oh crap, we gave up Fernando Tatis before steroids got a hold of him, then like shoot it happens once in a blue moon um so yeah just thinking like what the yankees could have gave up especially since we refused to play our prospects who we refused to give up um yeah yeah that really hurt like you and i speak a lot of times in dms about like trades and prospects and obviously i think i'm much more extreme than you are because i'm always saying just just get rid of the farm system (laughs) I was like, we don't need a minor league system. Everybody you get, you go and trade because all that matters is what's on the major league roster. Uh, and, and a lot of times I get out of hand, but I agree. Uh, Should have dumped out the farm system for Soto. Uh, fortunate for us, we still have all those guys so we can dump them for Otani, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, mm-hmm. in this offseason. We'll see how that plays out. Otherwise, we'll have to revisit that for our hot stove episode when it comes up uh, in the spring, you know? Well, yeah, I'd love to do a hot stove episode with you. Uh, And yeah, I already, uh, so Otani signed like the one-year tender for them, um, which was like $30 million. Um, Or yeah, it was a pre-arbitration contract. So flat $30 million for somebody who both pitches and uh, hits very well. Mm Yeah. one, that's a steal. Yeah. <laughs> Two, uh, reports came out, I think, early this morning or yesterday that Otani is already back in Japan. And he's very candid in interviews so far, talking about how he did not like this year with the Angels and the instability again of the franchise and how they are directionless. And he feels like he's wasting time there. And then, like, as, uh, you know, Japanese custom, he was like, I don't have anything else nice to say about my time <laughs> <laughs> with the angels this season and like left it at that. So like, this is a dude you got to trade. Like, yeah, the angels, they've had several people that they should have traded to replenish their farm system. Mike Trout's one of them. Yeah. They're, they need to trade. And Otani's the other guy that you have to trade. And the problem is when the GM doesn't want to be the guy who trades Otani, doesn't want to be the guy who trades Mike Trout, but you've had these great players You've had Trout for 10 years or whatever. Hasn't made a difference. You've had Otani for three or four years now. Hasn't made a difference. Yeah, like, I have some sympathy for Otani, because if you remember when he was coming over to the States, uh, the Yankees were somebody that were heavily recruiting him. They were sending, uh, was it Tanaka to talk to him? You know, and kind of sell him on New York. But at the end of the day, he chose... Uh, the Angels, because it's a shorter flight back to Japan. You know, it was just basically a proximity thing. And I don't think he liked New York, which New York isn't for everybody. But, you know, so he ends up signing with the Angels, and maybe he didn't know what he was getting into. Uh, but I have no simpy for Mike Trout, because <laughs> he had, you know, eight-plus years of his career of being on the Angels and seeing that, hey, they don't know what they're doing from a farm system standpoint, from a player acquisition standpoint. And he had his opportunity. uh, There's that word again. There it is. Uh, He had his opportunity a couple of years ago uh, to to get out of there. And he, for whatever reason, he signed a long-term deal with the Angels, which I believe has a no trade clause. You know, he cannot, he can, I'm sure he can approve a trade if it ever comes to it, but uh, he willingly, sentenced himself to a career's worth of nobody seeing your games and not making it to the playoffs. You know what we call that? We call that a walk behind her. <laughs> Mike Trout is a walk behind her, baby. You know, he's afraid of the lights. Turn them off. They're too bright. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't want it. Um, yeah. I lost a little, uh little respect for Trout. Just like, 
staying with a notably bad franchise. Um, you know, I know being the highest paid uh, position player by annual uh, value helps, <laughs> helps yeah. the pain. Um, but I, another reason Otani stayed or decided to go with the Angels, I don't know if you know this, um, we had a scout in the Yankee system, Andrew something, I don't remember his last name, and he went and scouted Otani like years ago. And him and Otani became friends. And he had the in with Otani, which is why the Yankees thought they had such a good chance with him. But this scout got hired by the Angels like the season or two before and was like a vice president of baseball operations or something. And so he had the in with Otani. Okay. And he was able to like help, like, hey, it's a short flight. Like all, all the reasons that you said, like, he had the relationship with Otani that the Yankees didn't have, the other teams in the mix just didn't have. Like, that was the familiar face. So it's, um, that helped it, it's kind of like a high school football recruit that uh, the college really wants, so they hire the high school coach as an assistant right. to kind of lure him in. Yeah. Uh, I was not aware of that. But uh, any other things you want to mention before we get on to the main event? Uh, yeah, I'll throw my trade of the year out there. Um, I talked about this franchise a little bit earlier. Uh, but the Seattle Mariners went out and they did the thing and they got Luis Castillo, uh, starting oh, okay. pitcher from the Cincinnati Reds. And I was even on the fence with uh, Castillo. I was like, he's a solid number two, right? You know, three worst case scenario. No, <laughs> this, dude, <laughs> this dude left a garbage team uh, and he proved that he's an ace. And Seattle Seattle gave up a lot to go get him. Like, they really cleared out their farm system to go get this dude. But he's another guy. Like, he had another year of control, I think. So he wasn't a true rental. And then they signed him to an extension before the playoffs. So he's going to be there um, for the next five years. And he signed, like, a sweetheart of a deal, too. It was, like, $100 million or something. Um, so oh, he's thanks. already <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's already outperformed his contract uh, and is due for another one. So, yeah, that was my trade of the year. I thought the Mariners – going out and making the big splash and it was again it was like three days before the deadline um and a lot of people didn't think that castillo would be moved like that soon they thought yeah. it would be like a you know 24 hour window type thing that was again one of those guys that we spoke about you know privately being a potential acquisition of the yankees and when for he years fell off, when he fell off the board we went into like a panic mode we we're like all right who's still out there and we thought we were getting uh, even money with Montas, you know, but uh, obviously that didn't pay off. But yeah. I am big jealous of Castillo. We've been mostly positive here. If we gave out a <laughs> negative award for a worst trade of the year, it's definitely the Yan it's not like the Yankees gave up really anything to go get Montas, but he has been a complete bomb. He's been Sunny Gray 2.0. Yeah. Um. And he's Sonny off the Gray playoff roster. The field, you know? <laughs> Sonny Gray showed up to work and didn't suddenly have a dead arm after two starts in New York. <sighs> yeah. Oh, bitterness. It leaks in again. <laughs> uh, at least we got uh, Trevino out of that deal. That's That was the main, the, the main piece we really got. Yeah, and it turned out we needed the bullpen arm, so yep. it worked out. But All right, Marcus, I think it's time for the main event of our awards. And we're going to go with the National League MVP. Who is your pick? Uh, I'm going a little chalk here. I am going with uh, Paul Goldschmidt from uh, the the first baseman for the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, this is a guy he kind of always had like MVP uh, hint to him. But I figured at this point in his career, eh, it's probably not going to happen. He's just going to be a, a really solid player. Maybe he'll have a top five year. But uh, he really strung together a monster year along with Arenado, who I thought was going to win it um, and be the one to stay hot. But it was Goldschmidt. He had a quiet September, but he had wrapped up the award by then. Uh, he stayed healthy the whole year and uh, he helped the Cardinals not just stay around 500, but like eventually end up taking that division from the division favorites, the Milwaukee Brewers, um, and completely knocked them out of the playoffs. So uh, Goldschmidt gets my vote. With uh, Freddie are... Freeman being a close second. Okay. Uh, Freddie Freeman had a great season. We are going to be in agreement on this, and uh, I, I dare say we might be in agreement on both MVPs, but we'll get to it when we get <laughs> to it. 
Paul Goldschmidt, as you mentioned, had a great season, 317 average, which uh, uh, I don't believe that was number one, but he uh, might have been. I, I don't have the stats in front of me, but 317 average, a 404 on base percentage, 35 home runs and 115 RBIs, as you mentioned, in the middle of a pretty darn good lineup. Uh, it's a no-brainer. Paul Goldschmidt wins. And you mentioned that at this point in his career, because he's been playing what feels like forever, going back to just years and years of losing on the Diamondbacks. Going into this season, I kind of had him in my mind as like a Rizzo-level player. You know, a mm-hmm. guy who, you know, isn't going to be your guy, your top guy, but would be a contributor. But he was a top guy on a loaded team. So, uh, you know, Paul Goldschmidt is also my NL MVP. Yep. Been playing since 2011, so <laughs> 11 years, yeah, it feel, yeah. yeah, it feels like it's been forever. But well, you know what it is. Every year in Arizona is three years in <laughs> real life. <laughs> it's the dry heat. <laughs> All right, so AL MVP. I am not going to do any pop and circumstance on this. I say it's Aaron Judge. Three set, three eleven batting average, four twenty six on base percentage, sixty one mm. home runs. The American League record, dare say it, the the non cool real record, <laughs> hundred and thirty one RBIs, and leader in every type of WAR, BABIP, FIB, DOS, UNO, every single type of statistical thing you can come up with. Aaron Judge led the league in by not a small margin. Marcus, take it from here, and then we'll start getting angry. Uh, This should be his second (laughs) American League MVP award going back to 2017, where he had an absolutely stellar campaign when he hit 52 home runs. Um, There's always, for whatever reason, maybe it's because he's 6'7 and a huge monster, there's always health concerns with Aaron Judge. There's all of the drama, which we can get to in a little bit, um, going into the season with him. Uh, none of it his fault, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but to show up and not just anchor to to carry the New York Yankees um, throughout the whole season. Uh, there was parts of the season where after the All Star break, where you could take his individual stats, and then you could take the rest of the team, and Aaron Judge was outperforming the rest of the team. There was several series uh, towards the back end of the season where we played like Tampa Bay and we played Houston, I think uh, back to back series, Aaron judge was responsible for every run scored, whether he batted them in or he was the run himself. Um, Like that's MVP type stuff. And it's not just the numbers he's putting up. It's the fact that it mattered to his team. You take Aaron judge off this team. I honestly don't know what the Yankees are. Like, I know they still have a super high payroll, but like, this is the heart and soul and the body (laughs) of the New York Yankees. Um, If Aaron judge wasn't on this club this year, um, it is possible that the Yankees would have finished behind the Orioles, you know, like there's no way that they are uh, catching up to the Rays. There's no way they're catching up to Boston or Toronto. They're going to be fighting it out with, well, I mean, Boston finished last, but just kind of my going into the season mindset. Uh, as you mentioned, the entire New York offense after the All-Star break was there and believe in Judge. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem is, Marcus, he doesn't pitch, so he can't win this award. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, no disrespect to Mr. Atani. He is also doing amazing things things that we haven't seen before in our lifetime really things that have never been done before people go back to babe ruth but babe ruth was only doing it against like old out of shape white dudes and they literally wouldn't let anybody else play the game (laughs) um so what Otani is doing is phenomenal um and like i don't want to take it for granted but he's not aaron judge and it's not having the impact that aaron judge has like aaron judge on He's also fielding like Otani doesn't feel he DHs. So like for Aaron Judge to play center field almost all of the season and center field's a position that is like unique to itself. Yeah, it's built Um, for speed, like smaller guys play an effective, you know, center field. Yeah, giant dudes that are 265 should not be playing center field because they're not physically capable but the judge figures out a way to do it. He's, he's a unicorn in that sense. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He played 
of an above average center field. He's a gold glove right fielder. They move him around to plug in the holes uh, as the season goes on, and he does it no problem. It's seamless, um, and that's not his role again. So, you know, sure, Otani pitches and Otani hits. Well, Aaron Judge hits better than Otani, and he also plays center field almost every day. Uh, Aaron Judge games played 157 out of 162. Yeah, and I. Uh... Last year, uh, Otani played eight games in the outfield, and they weren't starts. They were just like he would be pitching and he would be shifted uh, into the outfield. That was before they had the Otani rule where you can start a game as the pitcher and then kind of shift over to the DH. Um, here's my my measuring stick for it, and we can get stats in a second, but was Otani the best pitcher in the American League? No. No, he's not a Cy Young candidate. He might be in the top eight, you know, top seven, but he's not taking it from Verlander, from Cease. I dare say he's not taking it from Cole. So he's not the best pitcher in the American League. Uh, If he didn't pitch, is he a good enough hitter to win the American League MVP? Also, no. Yeah, no, he's, again, probably knocking on the top 10. I dare say probably not as good of a hitter as he is a pitcher. He's probably in the top 15, top 20, but nowhere close to the MVP race. So it comes down to this argument. Well, he does both. When you look at social media, you know, anytime somebody's arguing and somebody points at judges numbers, they'll say, well, what's his ERA? What's judges ERA? Meaning that like, if you are a pitcher and a hitter and are somewhat competent in both of them, you should just automatically win the MVP for the rest of your career. So why don't we just throw out the award? If if numbers don't matter, why don't we just throw out the award selection, just write Otani's name on it as long as he makes it a half of a season, you know, and just be all right, Otani won it this year, let's move on, and just forget about looking at stats or looking at, I don't know, how you contributed to your team winning because it's not the necessarily who had the best numbers award. Uh, although we're going to treat it like that, I guess. But there's an essence to like, how did you help your team win? Right. And Otani as a pitcher helped his team win. Otani as a batter didn't do anything because you would have games where Trout and Otani would <laughs> hit a home run and they'd lose 20 to six or 20 or something right. like that. Um, and I get it. That's not Otani's fault that the pitcher was terrible, but like you can't just automatically give an award to somebody just because they're doing something you haven't seen before. You know, there, there's something right. to be said about the fact that judge is the leader in every statistical category other than batting average by a million miles and, Which, and like, batting average. He was close. You know? He was close. He was close up until like the last three days of the season. Like yeah. he was he pressing, was, trying to get yeah. 62. Yeah. So um. Yeah, I just I don't know. Like, it's it's definitely cool what Otani's doing. Um, some people do just want to put Otani's name on the MVP award uh, until he's he's done or whatever. It doesn't have the impact. But uh, there was definitely a stretch there where the Angels were only winning games where Otani pitched. So like, there's something to that. But at the same time, how many games did they win? Like, <laughs> if you're so good and you're doing it on both sides of the ball, then, like, your bat needs to be carrying the team to wins. And when Mike Trout came back after the All-Star break from what was a career-threatening back injury that, like, kind of got swept under the rug and people didn't pay much attention to it, again, because he's out with a bum team <laughs> in California. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, when Mike Trout came back, like, Trout had more of an impact with a bad back than Otani did uh, in, through the whole season. So... You know, with the MVP award, I do look at impact like just, you know, it is a team game made up by individuals. But like you got to have an impact on your team, like you got to lead your team or be one of the main reasons that your team has success. Uh, You know, and it doesn't have to be in the playoffs, but like, can you at least be all the way up there? Like, can you be in the race up until the last week of the season? Like, that's at least what I want to see out of my MVP at the minimum. Yeah. And, and I don't want it to sound like I'm trying to bury Otani. 
I, I mentioned earlier in the show, I want Otani to be a Yankee. I will sacrifice several people that I know and love to get Otani on the New York Yankees. Definitely. He's a great player. But Judge had a historic season. You know, never before. I mean, people have won the Triple Crown, and obviously he fell short of the Triple Crown, but nobody won the Triple Crown with this type of numbers. Nobody led a league in home runs by this many and then also had a killer on base percentage, had a killer slugging percentage, had a killer war. Like everything that you can possibly quantify around him was just absurdly high, like historic levels. And I don't know the exact stats name. Obviously, we talked about war and wins above replacement, something you know a lot about. And <laughs> Judge, you know, the the knock on war was that it didn't take into account Otani's value as a pitcher. But there are all these extended wars and extended analysis numbers that like Fangraphs puts out on ESPN that take into account Otani as a pitcher and a hitter and factor that into war and judge as only a hitter and a fielder still beat Otani. So it's like, if you want to point at these advanced metrics, there's not a single one of them other than ERA, ERA and wins and, and thrown strikeouts. There's no like overall quantifiable number that justifies Otani being the MVP other than the fact that people are rightfully dazzled by his performance. Yeah. And another reason that I'm just blown away by Judge. Um, this is a stat I wanted to get out there. Uh, so during Babe Ruth's historic career, uh, 15 years with the New York Yankees, he faced a total of 342 different pitchers. Huh. Aaron Judge this season, and the last time the stat was updated was September 22nd, so you can probably add a couple to that list. Aaron Judge this season alone faced 244 pitchers wow <laughs> um it's almost it's a, almost a different game man um and for aaron judge be doing that against guys who come out of the bullpen and, and facing different pitchers three or four times a game fresh arms guys throwing 100 miles per hour just yeah. nobody's doing nobody did it like him yeah and and we'll get some flack from any baseball old timers to listen to this but you know, you can't compare numbers from 100 years ago. As you mentioned, baseball wasn't integrated, so there's a lot of talented athletes that weren't allowed to participate. And you had pitchers throwing 13 game or 13 inning complete <laughs> games. Uh, you know, so you'd have one guy going the entire time throwing his his 76 mile per hour heater. So there, <laughs> as you said, like you bring in this guy that's throwing 103 sidearm, you know, from yep. the, like not out of the stretch. There's no comparison to like what these modern guys are doing. Oh, I just don't see, unless you have this bias and granted we're, we're a little biased towards the Yankees. I, I don't think we are, but some people <laughs> might accuse us of being biased towards the Yankees, but I think we're trying to be objective and using numbers here. But unless you have an axe to grind against Aaron Judge or a huge bias for Otani, like what are you basing that selection of trying to trying to pick Otani? It makes no sense. When was the last time you were watching sports or other television and they cut into a baseball game? <laughs> I mean, they certainly didn't cut into any Otani at bats. They never cut into any Otani at bats, never cut into any Otani twelve strikeouts through six innings. Uh you know, in a loss to the Detroit Tigers, eight to four games. <laughs> like, it's just not happening with anybody, man. Um, you know, Judge did the thing this season. He's my MVP. We've never seen anything like it. We probably will never see anything like it again. I don't want to cap his um, uh, his potential because if he stays healthy, I don't see a reason why he can't hit 55 or 60 home runs again. Um, but yeah, and then there's the whole argument. He kind of brought it up like, you know, steroids integration like there's always something for every generation and why it was such a big deal that judge hit 62 this season um the testing is stricter than ever there's more banned substances than ever um whereas in bay Bruce day it was integration you move on to the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s you're getting into the amphetamine era and yeah. they didn't test for that until like 2000 and 
10, 11. Like it was the, it was like two collective bargaining agreements ago that that was finally like, Hey, <laughs> stop with the amphetamines and we're going to be <laughs> tested. <laughs> like, so guys were staying like laser focused, hyped up, charged up to play 162. So that's not an advantage that judge has anymore. Whereas that was something that like Roger Maris and like those guys definitely uh, were partaking in it's, it's noted history. Um, and then you have, you know, steroids, which I personally think steroids rock. And <laughs> <laughs> you show me a failed drug test administered by MLB that Barry Bonds failed. And um, then I think that you have a case if you want to negate Barry Bonds home run records or any of his stats. Uh, same goes for McGuire and Sosa. Um, I think the onus falls on MLB for not testing those years and turn not even turning a blind eye, but allowing it to happen and then later be like, no, no, no. Like, yeah. no, they breathed breath back into baseball. And then later on, you want to be like, that was a bad thing. Um, that's on MLB to test the players. Um, and if you're not going to test them, then, yeah, they're going to look for a competitive advantage. And it rocked. So yeah. I'm not mad <laughs> about that. Um, I mean, here's the thing. Steroids didn't. There's no way steroids help you hit a ball, like make contact. Uh, right. That it, takes a level of skill that steroids doesn't help you with. You know, it might help you turn a, a fly ball to the warning track into a home run, but it's very hard to hit a baseball and steroids don't help you there. And for every batter that was on the juice, there was a pitcher thrown to him that was on the juice. So, mm -hmm. you know, you got to deal with a guy who might unnaturally be hitting that hundred mile per hour that couldn't do it without a needle in his butt, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there is no scientific evidence that, uh, equates steroid usage, uh, to hand eye coordination. No, just doesn't I mean, exist. Makes your head bigger, but that's a different thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so judge for MVP of the world and the universe, and I'll put you on the spot, Marcus. We're not at the end of the season yet, uh, obviously, re end of the regular season, but we're a little bit away from free agency. Is judge a New York Yankee next year? I got to say yes. Yeah. Um, I just don't see how anybody... Much like you can't be the guy to trade Mike Trout or Shohei Otani, you cannot be the GM, especially when you're the New York Yankees. Like, you have an obligation to baseball. <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep this guy. He made an all-time bet, and now we can fill people in on the drama before the season. So, Aaron Judge, he got the call up when he was a bit older. In baseball, you have to play six seasons in order to hit free agency. Those six seasons, the team controls you. The first three years, you get paid bare minimum money, uh, which for us is good money. But when you're yeah. a baseball player and you're covering a lot of your own expenses and you've mortgaged a lot of your future to try to get to this point, like you're living in debt uh, and you very much are living on like bags of potatoes. Um, and it's a hard life for those guys coming up. Um, so when you make it to year three, you know, for four or five and six, you get arbitration. And so like either you or the team can either mutually agree or you take it to an independent arbitrator to be like, this is what you're actually worth based off of your performance plus what you got paid last. Right. Um, so this year, the Yankees went to arbitration with judge. They didn't sign him to an extension. They didn't want to go uh, uh, on like a one year. Hey, like, let's just call it even deal. They want to go to arbitration with Aaron Judge, which is absolutely insane. It's a very adverse position to take uh, with your best player for a franchise that does not go to arbitration. The Yankees are very good about, hey, this is what we're going to pay you this season. You good with it? Yeah. Um, they only take players to arbitration who they're trying to chase out. The last guy we took to arbitration uh, was Dellen Patances, who mm. we wanted <laughs> we wanted out. Um so, yeah, we went to arbitration with Judge. Thankfully, we reached a number, like, hours before arbitration. Um, but to take it up to that point, it's like, what are you doing? And you're daring him to bet on himself. And Cashman, at the end of his year presser, was talking about how when Aaron Judge is healthy, I think he said health or healthy in regards to Aaron Judge, like, seven times in a 19-second clip. 
and you can already tell that's the the angle that the Yankees are going to take to not pay this dude forty million dollars. And there's an argument that he earned himself even more. Um, I'm speculating that the number he was looking for was equal to, if not greater than what Trout got, which is 35 annual value. Um, and Judge is a big labor guy. He's always fighting for the players. Uh, he's in there fighting the owners, getting the players more opportunities. Nope. nope. Um, and getting more money. So Judge understands that, <laughs> hey, he just put up the best season that we've ever seen in baseball history. Um, and did it with the biggest franchise in baseball history with the lights on the brightest that they've ever been. He's going to go get paid. And if Aaron judge gets paid $500 million this off season, I would say that they might've even gotten a deal. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I expect Aaron judge to make it. I think conversations start with 40 million annual. Um, and the Giants have already come out and said they're looking to add. Um, they want to bring Judge home. He grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, Barry Bonds was one of his favorite players. So there's already an emotional aspect to going to play for the Giants. The Mets are going to have a lot of money coming off the books. And they have the new richest owner in baseball who loves to spend. Um, and give starting pitchers who pitch 15 games a year $45, $50 million for a season. Uh, so he's looking to spend, um, you know, I would say that all 30 teams should be in on this guy, but there's going to be some teams that are just out like Tampa and Baltimore. There's going to be a lot of competition. Um, and he is the, the prettiest girl at the ball. <laughs> I definitely agree with you. I think his, his pay per year will probably be the highest paid, you know, average annual value for any player in baseball. I don't know if he'll have the biggest overall contract because I don't know if some team is going to go and give him 10 years. Right. But my biggest concern, and this is something if you're listening to this and you're not a Yankee fan, you probably have it in your mind that the Yankees are the Yankees of George Steinbrenner, where they'll just open up the pocketbooks and spend whatever it takes. The current regime is very frugal. And mm -hmm. they like to, I apologize, Marcus, but they like to fuck around and just see what happens. Sure do. They, they like to, you know, be indirect and play games and, you know, yeah, we could offer X, but let's try offering 20% less than X to see what the reaction is. And my biggest concern is they can be doing this kind of diddle dallying and, and this dance with Judge. And as you mentioned, like the the Mets or the Giants can just swoop in and be like, hey, we're not going to screw around. Here's our offer that blows the the entry, the Cashman entry offer out of the water and have him just be like, screw you guys. You know, that's my only concern is somebody needs to take the spending, uh, the checkbook away from Cashman if he's mm -hmm. not willing to to make the the moves that are necessary. And how? Right. Yeah. Take so some higher power needs to come in and intervene. I don't care if it's George Steinbrenner reaching up from the earth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it's George Steinbrenner, George Costanza. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. I and the there's some crazy stat how like the Yankees are like plus uh, it's estimated like they win an extra like it's not exactly war, but like judge factors into like an extra like 60 games that the Yankees would win or something like that. Yeah. It's like, there's no way that you can let this dude out the door. Um, yeah. But we'll, we'll see. see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, what, so what's your project, your, your prediction? Ah, uh, I think, you know, gun to my head. I think he ends up a Yankee. Okay. Um, I think, and I know nothing about him as a person, but I think if I had to guess, he probably really likes his teammates, you know, like just the people that he's already friends with, whether it be Rizzo or Stanton or Glaber. There seems to be a genuine camaraderie there. Um, I can see there being some value in being the face of the like one of the biggest brands and sports, you know, in a major market. So even if 
the Giants offer you more money, it's like you can make that up in endorsements and merchandising and stuff like that being on the New York Yankees. Um, as long as New York doesn't come out and lowball them and try to dangle this alleged injury history uh, mm. during negotiations. And let's be real. Like a lot of his injuries, like, okay, he was hit in the hand by a pitch and it broke a, a bone in his hand. Oh, yeah, that's his fault. You know, and missed a bunch of time for that. And the other little freak injuries. He had a he's, foot injury, which was misdiagnosed by the New York Yankees. And he had an intercostal injury, which was misdiagnosed by the New York Yankees. Yeah. So it's not like he's just this lumbering guy that's breaking down like a Zion in the NBA. You know, he's, <laughs> he's a guy who for the most part, is there for you every day. So as long as Cashman doesn't try being a cheapskate, I think he's back on the Yankees. Uh, but I am not confident. I'd say I give it like a 65% chance he's back on the Yankees. Yeah, and we talked. I talked about money coming off the books for like the Mets and the Giants. Uh, the Yankees have a lot of money coming off the books. Araldis Chapman, $15 yeah, million. Dollars. <laughs> Zach Britton is $12 million. That's almost $30 million right there. Plus you add on what you're going to pay Judge anyways. You've already cleared the annual value of Judge and you already have extra money to spend. So the money is there for the Yankees. It's just a matter of do they want to be the team that commits to this dude? It is a big contract, but also like it's earned. And if this guy has already taken you now to the ALCS, um, we'll see how far he goes. Just, I just can't see any universe where they let him let him go. But I can also see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, take the the performance on the field away. Like, how much is he contributing to your merchandising? And you're a man who knows all about making money at the merch table. And uh, you know your ticket sales and your television revenue and all of that stuff is going to take a massive hit if he's gone. You know, yes, you're going to lose a lot more games too, but you're also uh, going to make a lot less money. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well. But I digress. I think we made our case for so. Aaron Judge uh, as like all world MVP. And all that is left, Marcus, is we are down to the final four teams. In the American League, we have the dreaded, hated Houston Astros versus the young upstarts, the New York Yankees. And we have the San Diego Padres versus the Philadelphia Fighting Phillies. Why don't we start with the uh, National League? Who do you see coming out of the series? So I think this is going to go six or seven. Um, it's like I love the hitting more. For the Phillies. Yeah. I think they have more more clearly defined roles on their team. I feel like with the Padres, Trent Grisham's been playing out of his mind. Um, but it's like, don't let Machado beat you. And watch out for Soto, who still hasn't found the power in San Diego yet. But, like, you got to keep him off the base and don't let Machado hit a homer with, like, men on base. And I think you can beat the Padres. Um but the Padres pitching is crazy because they have four to five actual starters who can go. Yeah. Um, and they can piggyback two of those starters and really shut you out for a game four. No problem. Yeah. So, like, Philly's got to watch out for that. But I just feel like I think there's something to – and I, th <laughs> I think we're seeing it. There's, like – Playoffs can go one or two ways for teams where it's like either you're the hot team who like kind of had a middling season and like you get hot at the right time or you're just this powerhouse that's consistent through the whole season. And we've seen that on the AL with who came out. But on the NL, it's like two teams that turned on the Jets as, uh, you know, the calendar flipped over to September and October. So I'm going to ride the Phillies. Um, yeah, I just feel like they they have it. And I think if they can get Nola. And if they can get Wheeler to take the first two games, and if they can steal a game with the Suarez and Cindergaard piggyback, mm -hmm. I think they've got it. I'm going to agree with you with the Phillies, and this is my reason why. Uh, as you mentioned, Padres pitching is top notch, and usually pitching in the playoffs is the most important thing. Like a good pitcher will shut down a good hitter every single mm -hmm. time. 
Um, but I want to talk about what you said as far as momentum goes. If you go back to this Yankees versus Guardians series, and I don't mean this as any kind of insult on the Guardians, and I think you'll understand when you when you hear it. The Guardians had all of the momentum. The Guardians were the hot team, mm-hmm. but they didn't have the 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 talent to uh, that was necessary to put up the runs to compete with the Yankees. Uh, they had the talent to to have these rallies in the ninth to get the bloop and the stolen base and the lucky hit and the the extra, they, they had the talent to make these kind of these rallies. But they didn't have the guys that consist could consistently put it over the porch. Right. The Phillies are the Guardians, but with a lot of extra power hitters thrown on top right. of it. They are a team that can manufacture runs and rally in the bottom of the ninth with two outs and down by four. They have that kind of energy and pop. But at the same time, they have Rio Muto. They have Harper. Uh, they have, I'm forgetting his name, their first name, Hoskins. Hoskins. They have these guys who are their judge and their Stantons, you know, who could just all of a sudden hit a three-run bomb, but they also have the guys that can hit the bloop single out of nowhere and, and get a right. couple of ducks on the pond. Yeah. So uh, I like the Padres pitching. I like their, maybe the top third of their lineup, but overall, I think the momentum being on the side of the Phillies, I like them making it to the World Series. And, you know, it would be a cool thing, like good for the Phils. Yeah, good for the Phils, and like that's a team they gave the big contract to Bryce Harper uh, a mm-hmm. couple seasons ago, and they kind of spent the first two years of that contract like, ooh, are we World Series contenders? And when you sign Bryce Harper to a three hundred million dollar contract, you pay him almost thirty million dollars a year. You're you need to be a World Series contender. Yeah. Um, and they finally went out this off season, and they spent big on Cast uh, Castellanos, and they spent big on keeping Real Muto last season. And I forgot about Schwarber. That's a guy another like guy that they paid, you know, tested. Yeah. You know, he came in. So yeah, they have like four or five dudes who can clear the fence easily, but then they also have four or five dudes who can get on base, um, but can also make a blast happen too. Like Alec Bohm, their rookie third baseman. Uh, he's a guy who could easily take you deep or he could work a walk or he could just get a single in there. He's kind of one of those like X factor players that you worry about in the bottom of the lineup. Yeah, and they have, uh, I'm just pulling it up right now because I forget his name. They have a rookie utility infielder. Um, uh, Virlin or uh, Matt starts with a V. No, you know what? My fantasy baseball app is not logged in on my new phone, but uh, um, I don't have it in front of me. But they, whoever is a Phillies fan is probably yelling at this, but it's a guy who's like in the top five or six of uh, rookie of the year finalists. Uh, uh, Virling, yeah. That might be him. But. I think it's Matt Virling. Uh, so they have a lot of young guys. They have veterans, like I mentioned, uh, but the, 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 they have postseason experience. I like the Phillies. I won't go. I won't belabor the point. Marcus. Oh, they also have Bryson Stott. Maybe that's Bryson Stott's the guy okay. I was thinking of. Yeah, Bryson Stott. Uh, the reason why he sticks in my head is he was, uh, I, I want to say, like high school, like teammate with Bryce Harper. And like they're buddies and like they train together and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. so he, yep. he came out of camp like uh People were really high on him. He had a slow start to the season, but he turned it on after the break. Yeah, he's out of Nevada. Yeah. All right, last one. Astros versus Yankees. Marcus, what's your prediction? The Houston Astros. Yeah, same. Um, <laughs> for everything great about the New York Yankees that we just waxed eloquently about, um, the New York Yankees have glaring outfielding problems um they have a glaring problem with investing a season into a stopgap shortstop in isaiah kiner falefa Hmm. who had played one great defensive season which was the covid shortened 60 some game season and he played at third base Hmm. um for a team that nobody was watching or caring about uh we played him all season he ranked towards the bottom of the league defensively. But Aaron Boone and the Yankees front office kept saying that he's one of the best shortstops in the game. But when it turned out that when our backs were against the wall and we needed to put our very best lineup in to save the season, IKF rode the bench. Yeah. And it was very apparent early on in April that 
uh, as Waldo Cabrera was ready. And that's who Cashman had even mentioned. Hey, we're not going to spend big because we have Peraza and we have Cabrera coming up. And they're almost ready. Cabrera needs to work on his hitting. He went on a power tear. Got called up. He's been amazing. But we wouldn't play him at shortstop. We'd play him in the outfield. We'd play him at second base. Well, he's finally playing shortstop. And he's making great plays. Um, And we kind of use him as a utility guy. So... I'm hoping that we stick with Cabrera at short. IKF cannot be on this roster. He's taking up a roster spot because he can only play shortstop and he doesn't play it well. So yeah. there's nowhere else to play him. Um, I worry about our bullpen. They were heavily used down the stretch to end the season, plus the Guardian series. Um, you know, Wandy Peralta pitched all five games. <laughs> yeah, first time ever that that's happened. Yeah, so... You know, he could continue pitching out of his mind, right? And just kind of like empty everything he has into this postseason and then probably be a bum the rest of his career. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> still be a Yankee on. legend, yeah. Right. Um, but the Astros are just this juggernaut that they just keep reloading. Um, they just keep replenishing from their farm system. They plan these things out. They lost Carlos Correa, probably the best shortstop in baseball. If not, he's top three, top five. Yeah. Um, lost Springer. They lost Springer a couple seasons ago. No problem. Like they just keep replacing players with guys from their farm system. Um, they had Verlander miss a season. No problem. Like they just replace them with arms from their farm system. It's, it's, it's almost like I'm jealous of just how well they run their organization. And that's what's so frustrating going back to 2017 is that they didn't need to cheat to beat us. Yeah. Um, they are that good. Uh, top to bottom. Now, unlike those, the 2017 year, their lineup is not as stacked. You get past the first five of their lineup, and you've got some easy outs, six, seven, eight, nine. But they're still very top heavy. Like Alvarez is going to give us some some sleepless nights. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, he's going to clip us for sure. Altuve is going to clip us for sure. Um, Kyle Tucker is probably going to have a big game somewhere. Bregman. Bregman always clips. Yeah. Like those are their big players you got to watch out for. Um, I I think so. I agree with just everything you said. My biggest concerns uh, going into this series, Astros notwithstanding, like Yankees, the current Yankees coming out of that Guardian series against any playoff team that's left in this playoffs, I, I would be hard pressed to pick the Yankees to win because of just the fiasco of our pitching staff going into the playoffs was Mm -hmm. depleted and weak. And then you get this five game series where everybody was used. Almost everybody was used to their maximum. And then they got to show up tomorrow in Houston and play a super refreshed Astros team that was able to completely reset their bullpen, reset their pitching rotation. Yankees, everybody's going in there with, like, not a full week's arrest. And, yes, we're starting the series with Tyon, but even he had that relief appearance during the the Guardians series. So from a pitching standpoint, yes, maybe Cole in some world could line up against Verlander and they can both equal each other's zeros. I I think Verlander still has the edge, Mm -hmm. but we're not getting that matchup and we're not getting their number two against our number two. It's just the the pitching rotation is just so messed up based on injuries, based on the playoffs, all that. And you mentioned that the back half of the Astros lineup is weak. I love the New York Yankees, but we field so many automatic outs on a daily basis. There are players on that team that if they get a single, I am shocked. You know, there's auto Hicks automatic out, uh, Trevino lately automatic yeah. out. Glaber up until these playoffs was a automatic out. IKF, God help us, automatic out. Uh, Bader's supposed to be an automatic out. Yeah, he he's playing through. out of his mind. Yeah, Marwin Gonzalez is an automatic out. Uh, there's sometimes if Judge or Stanton or Rizzo are on a cold streak, those yeah. are some guys that are like. As much as I love them, and they they put up a lot of runs in this last playoff series, 
if you want to talk, who do I trust to be more consistent? Uh, like Bregman, uh, Al- Altuve, or the other Astro top of their lineup, or Judge Stanton and, and Rizzo. I think that there's going to be entire games where the Yankee power hitters just don't show up, and that's the what Yankees I'm just hit. I, if I saw the stat correctly, they just hit like 182 during the Guardian series, yeah. which is the lowest recorded team batting average for a team to win a series and advance in the postseason. Yeah, it, like, they were saved by the home runs. You yeah, know? the bats are cold. The Yankees' bats are absolutely cold. Um, we turn it on for two games. Um, but again, it's the long ball. Um, and Houston doesn't give them up. Houston doesn't give them up, for one. And Houston, can they can play that game, or they can just slap singles and doubles um, and cut you that way. We've seen the Yankees win lots of different kind of ways during the season, but like our tried-and-true formula, it's the extra base hits. Um, we got to get men on base and we got to capitalize uh, during those moments. We can't have judge going two for 14 in a series with 13 strikeouts. Yeah. <laughs> I can't have base running errors by Donaldson. Another guy who's most often a, an automatic out. Don't you know? get me started on that. Yeah. <laughs> so Astros, how many games do they, did the Yankees take one or two or three? Six. Did they make a series of it? Astros and six. See, you're giving the Yankees too more credit than I would. Um, <laughs> so it's a best of seven. Does it go three, two, and two? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure about the the layout of it. Like, it. I just I don't see us taking any of them in Houston. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I I think best case is five. I hope I'm wrong. You know, I would love a miracle season, but like I see Astros in five. Um, I see Yankees maybe squeaking out one, like the coal, the coal outing. Cause it'll probably Gary Cole will line up against the back of the rotation starter for the Astros. And we'll somehow get that one, you know, and I don't know. I, I say five Astros and five. Yeah. I think the, um, because of the collective bargaining agreement delay this season, it's, I know it's like this for the NL and I think it's like this for the AL it's you get your rest day after like game one or two and then you only have one more rest day and then i think once you get to games like five six and seven once it goes back to the once it goes back to home field advantage there's no more off days so after game was that after game five or is it yeah i'm not sure i'm very fuzzy two, on this. Two, three two and two right i'm not sure if that's right but whatever it is <laughs> um yeah, whatever it is, after, yeah, like there's no more, there's no more travel, so uh, no more travel, travel days off. So I think that benefits the Astros, but at the same time, the Yankees have only played five games in the last 17 days, uh, and I think it's even like four and 14 if you want to lower it. So Yankees ideally should be rested, but. Yeah, I don't know. After after that Guardian series, it just feels like Houston has us again. They've just yeah. been better managed. They've been prepared. Like we were kind of peeking into the playoffs back in um, July and August. The Astros have been looking into the playoffs since <laughs> April or May. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully we're wrong. You know, we'll see. I think uh, you know, as much of a Yankee homers as we are, we try to be realistic with our expectations based on what we've seen so we are basically i you said you were for the phillies right yeah okay so we're both basically saying phillies astros and the world series i know it's a long way out you can't predict what happened in the series leading up to it but if that series was starting right now who's winning that Uh, i'm gonna go with the houston astros yeah i i think Aside from Schwarber and maybe a couple guys that I'm forgetting about, you know, there's not a lot of playoff battle tested people on the Phillies. No. Uh, people forget that the Nationals won a World Series after they lost Harper, right. you know, so uh, I, I don't think we need to go into great detail on it. But uh, man, I hate to say it, but those damn cheating Astros are my World Series pick. Hey, we mentioned earlier how Seattle had the longest playoff drought in major sports. Well, the Phillies had the second longest uh, yeah. that they ended this year. Um, so, yeah, there's – and Gene Segura had the most at-bats for somebody not in the playoffs 
uh, in major league, like in recent major league history, like in the last 50 years or something ridiculous like that. Wow. Um, so yeah, there, that roster is not playoff tested. Um, hopefully, uh, like ignorance is kind of bliss for them, but yeah. yeah, I just think it's the Astros and like, it also comes down to managing like dusty Baker is one of the best baseball managers of all time, in my opinion. Uh, definitely has his, his faults, but in shortcomings as a manager, but I love Dusty Baker and he's the perfect manager for that team to navigate them, uh, out of the, the cheating scandal, uh, and the different major departures they've had through free agency. I, yeah, I just think Astros have the advantage pitching, hitting, fielding, coaching, home field advantage. It all lines yeah. up Houston. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. I I'm not hoping that that's what happens. Absolutely not. Yeah, if I'm if I'm a betting man, that's the way I'm going. Uh, if the Yankees can't win the World Series, I'm rooting for the Phils. Absolutely. Uh, if the Phils can't do it, I'm rooting for the Padres. Mm -hmm. If the Padres can't do it, I'm rooting that they just call off the season. <laughs> uh, but if I got to pick a winner, it's going to be the Astros. Yeah, I hope the earth opens up and uh, swallows <laughs> Houston whole. <laughs> yeah, at least the stadium, an empty stadium. Yeah. But Marcus... I think this was a successful episode. What about you? Uh, highly successful. I super enjoyed myself. And, uh, you know, maybe we need to run it back for football season or something. Ooh, yeah. Maybe uh, preview the the playoffs, see what those Chiefs are up to. I, I hear that the, the Bills just won their Super Bowl. Well, they sure did. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, they beat the Kansas City Chiefs in a tough, hard-fought game. And don't you know it, that they are now the class of the AFC <laughs> just like last year and where to get them <laughs> yeah i mean the only thing i can say is that mitch trubisky beat tom brady so yeah, like so much for legacy <laughs> i'm so happy that y'all beat tom brady in the the bucks uh tom brady who is ditching practice on wednesdays who ditched practice on friday who hung out with his buddies on saturday and didn't do the team walkthrough and he just walks in on sunday expecting to beat a professional football team and I don't care who you are. Yeah. You're, that's not going to happen that easily. So I'm happy your Steelers put it on him. Uh, I'm happy he lost to both a rookie quarterback and a, a bad quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> a um, very handsome bad quarterback, though. Very handsome. Very game. handsome, oh. given that. Um, a defense that's without <laughs> their best player. Uh, yeah. Loved it. And uh, thank you for that. So, hey. Absolutely. Good yeah, that'll be, that'll be our next episode of Sports Talk. Uh, I, I do have a, a football question to ask you. Uh oh. All right. Um, you've never been in this position before because much like my Kansas city chiefs, your Pittsburgh Steelers are winners. You okay. are a winning franchise. This no shade whatsoever. Appreciate I love it. Mike Tomlin as a head coach, the standard of excellence that the, the Steelers have. I respect the heck out of uh, even the last couple seasons where you should have thrown the towel and you have Duck Hodges in there, <laughs> you find a way to make it to 500 and to be in the playoff race the last week of the season. Um, that said, you have the rare opportunity to nope. possibly get, oh, there's that word again, <laughs> to possibly get the first, second, third pick of the upcoming NFL draft without your team tanking. Mm. Like, you guys didn't go into the season like, hey, we're tanking, like, you pay the, you have a lot of players you're paying a lot of money to. You have a lot of good draft picks from uh, the last draft, like George Pickens. Um, what do you want? Do you want your team who's probably doesn't have a Super Bowl run in them, um, mm -hmm. but maybe they could make the playoffs and be one and done again? Do you want to continue that, or do you want to tank? Uh, not tank, but do you yeah. want to see your team sure. competitively um, – not win. <laughs> games. Oh yeah, I get you. Um, that's a very good question. I here's the thing: even if the Steelers get a middle of the draft pick, I think the Steelers have demonstrated they're very good at player evaluation and selection. Absolutely. All of their wide receiver hits are late round guys. Uh, you know, they they never draft a wide receiver in the first couple. Uh, like the first couple picks of a draft. They never take a running back like really high. Uh, even uh, our quarterback this year, he was not 17th overall, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so Kenny Pickett wasn't like a number one overall pick. So 
I don't feel like they need the number one overall pick, the number two overall pick, the number three overall pick to get great value in the draft. Uh, For me, my goal going into this season is my same goal I had going into last season, which I assumed was a lost season, uh, is, well, last year it was B8 and 8 or better. You know, this year there's an extra game. So my fingers crossed hope is 9 and 7, which I think is unrealistic, but that's my pie in the sky thing. Like where you have Super Bowl aspirations... I my have aspirations for nine and seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if they can somehow squeeze that out, I mean they're one game out of first place right now in their division. That's insane. Yeah, <laughs> That's insane. Uh, they're one game behind the the Bengals, who they have a win on, and the Ravens. You know, so uh, I I would like to continue Tomlin's streak of never having a losing season. Um, my last losing season was with Tommy Maddox at quarterback in 2003. I remember that season. Even then that was seven and nine. So that wasn't like this terrible, like Cleveland Browns type season. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so my, my dream is to finish nine and seven. You get a middling middle of the row draft pick. I mean, TJ Watt was a middle of the first round guy, you know, uh, Antonio Brown, say what you want about him. He was a sixth round guy. Yeah. So I think Pittsburgh's good at, at selecting talent. It's not like they're going to go and try to get a quarterback. So let's go. Let's try to go 500 or a game above 500. That's the thing. Cause like, if you end up with a top five pick, you're in the quarterback conversation with three good ones coming out this year. I know it's a good running back class too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the quarterbacks are going to go high this year, especially since last year was kind of sparse with the quarterbacks. So it's like, oof, do you already toss in the towel on Pickett? Which some no. teams have done, like Arizona, going uh, Josh Rosen, and then the next year going Kyler Murray, and just be like, hey, it's not working out. Let's take another quarterback. That's what the analytics say to do. But also, you guys are going to get value no matter where you are. So like, do you trade back? Do you trade out? Like, I can tell you, if I had to put uh, a bet on it, and I don't follow a lot of college football, but I can see them taking uh, Joey Porter's kid out of Penn State. Mm. Uh, first round talent, uh, cornerback and okay. Pittsburgh needs secondary help. Uh, they need offensive line and secondary. Uh, and that's a guy who, you know, already has ties to the Pittsburgh organization plays in Pennsylvania, um, would address an immediate need, a glaring need. So, and, and they're saying middle to, to late first round. So I can see that with him, you know, okay. so we'll see again, we'll address that. Uh, hopefully when we get back together, absolutely. Marcus, do you have anything to plug? Uh, Final Wrestling Place right here on the soon-to-be-named network with myself and Mr. Tim. Uh, If you happen to be unfamiliar, we take the nouns professional wrestling, uh, and we put them into either a good place or the bad place. Uh, And another podcast uh, also do with Mr. Tim is Viewer's Choice, where after every major WWE premium live event and AEW (laughs) pay-per-view, we give you a quick breakdown uh you know 40 50 minutes or so uh, and tell you what to watch what to skip uh and let you know who the mvp of the show is and then a a third project i have going on is over on the north south connection uh where you can find various choice as well uh and that is with jt and we do wwe war which is where we take a baseball style analytical analytical based approach towards wwe pay-per-views review them in seasons starting with the first pay-per-view after wrestlemania and ending with that year's WrestleMania, as opposed to a traditional January to December look. Um, and we have different different categories that we give like a plus minus points based system um, to. So uh, that's a fun project where right now we are finishing up 2004, 2005. So go ahead and check those out. Nice. Obviously, this has been a special presentation of Porch Talk, uh, my regular weekly podcast with Todd Roker from Longbox Heroes. Um, But go ahead and also check me out on At Odds with Wrestling. And this coming Friday, myself and many people from the soon-to-be-named network will be at Sokols in Bethlehem for the LVAC Let's Hang Out event. And uh, I'm going to cheer on Gummy Boar. Uh, everybody can go and have their own individual agendas, but that's uh, that's why I go. That and the, the like, the three dollar bottled beers. But uh, can't should be a it. good time. Yeah, but. can't beat that. And uh, I think I, I think I might show up there too. Oh, nice. Yeah. Sweet. Looking forward to seeing you there, buddy. And anybody else that comes out. But again, Marcus, thank you. I won't keep you on. I, I assume when I originally contacted you about this, I was like, maybe we'll talk for a half hour. 
no. 45 <laughs> minutes, uh, but it's going on now almost two hours. Uh, but uh, thank you again for coming on. And uh, again, this has been Sports Shock. You're listening to the soon-to-be-named network, the Lamborghini of Podcast Network.